So uh, just by way of introduction, um, the J.D. Irving Limited manages a, a lot of forest land across the region. And uh, the map shows uh, uh, the lands that we manage from northern Maine through New Brunswick and into Nova Scotia. The green being uh, um, freehold land and the orange being crown lease land uh, uh, primarily in New Brunswick. The, uh, I'm not going to get into the details, uh, but the, the blue rectangles represent various uh, types of forest uh, uh, um, or wood processing or fiber processing facilities anywhere from uh, um, the, uh, the tissue manufacturing plant in, in, in Moncton here to, uh, to Cedar Mill up in, in, in northwestern New Brunswick. So pretty much a range of, of forest products. The company has a long history in planting trees and uh, um, started by Mr. Casey Irving in 1957 and since that time the company's planted about 800, over 850 million. Um, further along with that, um, our current reforestation stock production capacity is around 26 million seedlings. So that's the, uh, um, that's basically enough seedlings on an annual basis to plant somewhere around 10,000 hectares of, of, of land. Um, most of that is grown as mixtures of species these days, mixtures of spruce and pine species. And, uh, and uh, we, we operate two production nurseries. One is more research focused in, uh, in Sussex and that's, that's where, uh, um, where my office is. The, uh, the main production nursery is in Juniper and uh, there we operate uh, six of these large uh, greenhouse facilities. And here's an interior shot. You're looking at, at, uh, at two million seedlings in that right, uh, right in front of you there. Um, and we, we double crop those, so two crops a year, and, uh, and, and that's, uh, that's where most of the trees are grown. Now, the, the, the one thing I wanted to explain a little bit is, is the planting efforts that we do. They're aimed at softwood or softwood-dominated forest types. And uh, when, when we get talking about all this work, I'm going to be talking about conifers. And it's not that the company doesn't manage or is interested in, in, in hardwoods. Um, basically, hardwoods are managed through natural regeneration. So we do a lot of work in managing hardwoods as well. But I'm primarily going to be talking about softwoods, the trees that we, uh, we plant. So genomics and forestry, it's, it's uh, long been promised as providing information to help uh, forest managers and scientists. I know I personally became aware of that about 1983 and there people were talking about the potential for isoenzymes as a selection tool. Well, it, you know, that really didn't pan out, but you know, the, the, uh, the genomics business has changed enormously. And, but uh, but in, in forestry, it's largely aimed at enhancing traditional tree improvement programs through marker-aided selection. That's, that's been you know, what people think about when they think about genomics largely. And, uh, and, and basically it's aimed at improving selection efficiency, so, so the amount of genetic gain you can achieve per decade, and, and certainly accuracy when, when you're talking about genotype versus phenotype. So I want to cover off the sort of basic tree improvement steps because I, I suspect there's, there's a fair number of folks in the room that may not have been exposed to that before. But, uh, but basically, tree improvement programs follow some pretty basic steps. Beginning with uh, selection of a, of, a, of a breeding population and, and what that meant is in the late 70s and early 80s, Folks were uh, traveling through the forest, selecting the best individuals they could find of the species that, uh, that we were interested in. And uh, that began with a couple of the spruces, white spruce, black spruce, uh, jack pine, um, uh, red spruce, and then gradually expanded as, as reforestation programs started including other species like white pine. Uh, there was a little bit of work done with tamarack. But the, uh, the photo you see is a very nice uh, white pine selection. And uh, so the sort of traits you were looking for was, uh, was growth rate, how straight the bowl is, size of the branches, um, insect and disease resistance, 
uh, wood density. These are the sort of things that were, uh, were, uh, uh, folks were looking at. And just as an example, the map of New Brunswick shows for a particular species, in this case black spruce, the dots on the map represent about 1,200 initial selections that were made um, early on in the tree improvement program. And, and that's really important because in tree improvement, we're not talking about potatoes or, or uh, livestock. We're talking about an organism that's going to be out there living for 50 years. It's not very mobile. And, uh, and, and so really improving the economic value is always very important to us, but maintaining broad genetic diversity is critical as well. So we have to start with big base populations and, and, uh, and that, that complicates things from, certainly from, a, from a, a selection and breeding standpoint. So the next step in the process is to bring some of these trees together in a place where they can cross pollinate and produce seed that you can use in the nurseries. And the way you do that is by grafting those individuals that were selected. So you might make uh, um, 80 or 100 grafts of each individual uh, superior selection. And these are planted out in a, in a seed orchard, um, very much like an apple orchard, except it's growing spruce trees, where, where a number of these, uh, these uh, superior trees can, can cross-pollinate and produce seed. Um, the aerial photograph is, uh, is, uh, is the J.D. Irving uh, um, seed orchard, which is about a half hour's drive from here near Petticodiac. And there's, uh, there's orchards for, for uh, six different species of conifers there. And, and really the whole purpose of that place, of that, that, uh, um, this, uh, this production facility is to produce cones. And from that we extract the seeds and basically all that the seed that we're using is coming from a seed orchard today. So um, up to this point we know every tree that, that is in the seed orchard is, uh, comes from very good tree in the woods. But what you see in the woods is a combination of, of the genetics of the tree and, and the environment it's growing. So, uh, so we have to undergo a, a breeding and testing program and what that involves is uh, isolating female flowers on the trees and uh, first of all you design a, a, a mating design that you want to carry out. You isolate the female flowers that you want to cross and then uh, harvest pollen from the tree that you want to cross with it and, uh, and inject the pollen that you want into the bag so you can, you, can, uh, you can know the mother and the father of every seed that's produced in those cones. You take many, many of these families and extract the seeds separately, grow them in the nursery separately, and then, and then establish these replicated uh, um, experiments ac across the whole region that you can, you can monitor and go back and measure for various uh, traits over time. And uh, based on the information, th those, those progeny tests are really the engine of the whole thing. Based on the data that you get from there, um, analyze on the computer, you can determine which of the parents in your breeding program were, were really genetically superior uh, for the traits that, that you're looking into versus the ones that were maybe just average but growing in a very good environment. So, uh, so we always planned the seed orchard to go back down there and cut out half of the trees that, that didn't pan out so good in the progeny test. The other thing that happens with the, uh, the progeny tests is because they're spread out across the region, you, you get a very good fix on adaptive variation patterns within, within the species and, and you're able to identify, you know, should, do you need to separate populations for say northern New Brunswick versus central Nova Scotia? That's, that's the kind of information that, you know, when we produce seed, we have to have broadly adapted seed sources. But the flip side of that is now all the concern on, on climate change, these tests that are planted across the region, they're actually probably one of the most proactive things you can do from an adaptation standpoint to deal with climate change. So then the last thing with these progeny tests is uh, when you've determined the best families, you can go back into the best families and select the best individuals to start the cycle all over again. So as you can see, it takes a long time and uh, um, I've been working in the business for over 30 years 
and, uh, and we're well into second generation for some species. Some of the ones that we started with a little bit later, we're still, we're still towards the end of first generation. So uh, um, it's, uh, it's, it's a long-term proposition. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the new technology opportunities that are out there to, uh, to sort of speed up the whole process. And then we'll get into the genomics applications. So, you know, the traditional seed orchards are tried and true. They produce very good seed, high quality for, for uh, reforestation. Uh, but there's certainly uh, uh, some drawbacks. That long generation time, you know, by the time you add up the grafting, breeding, field testing, you're talking about 20 years for most of our species. So it might be good for uh, uh, career longevity, but, uh, but it's, uh, you know, when, when I listen to tomato breeders or potato breeders, you know, there's kind of impatient at the same time. But, uh, and actually so is the boss. So, uh, so that's always something that Mr. Irving was very uh, focused on, is how can we go faster in, in this business? So there's the, the long generation time isn't very flexible. An orchard, once you got an orchard planted, you know, you can do some things, you can cut out the inferior ones, but what you got is what you got. So not very flexible. And, uh, and it, it can also be difficult to deal with adverse uh, genetic correlations. So you may have two traits that are important to you, say uh, growth rate and wood density. You know, if you have a, even a slight negative genetic correlation, you have to pay attention to that. And, and orchards aren't very flexible mechanisms to, uh, to deal with those situations. So the one, poten the, the one potential approach we've looked into and, and spent a lot of time at over the last 15 years is uh, the production of varieties using somatic embryogenesis, which is a tissue culture method, and using that along with cryostorage um, to, to, to uh, uh, develop ways to deal with some of these drawbacks. So I'm really quickly going to go over the steps, but basically what you do is you make many crosses among tested parents. So you can make a lot of handfuls of seeds where you know the mother and the father and you know on average that family is going to be very good. Um, you can take the embryo out of every single seed <clears throat> and, uh, and then produce embryogenic callus from each one of those, uh, those tissue cultures. Then you can take some of that callus and uh, cryostore it. So basically in liquid nitrogen, it'll sit for as long as you want it to sit. And at the same time, if you mature some embryos from each one of those, those calluses, you can produce embryos and then germinate them and uh, grow seedlings and plant them across a whole range of test sites for, for monitoring. So visually, um, this is what a spruce seed looks like, and the embryo that's inside there that you excise, you can turn that into uh, embryogenic tissue, and this is the material that you can put in the cryo tank. At the same time, you take enough of the callus that you can, uh, on, a, on a maturation medium, you can produce these genetically identical uh, embryos of the, of the original seed and uh, take those and germinate them on, uh, in growth dishes, grow them in the nursery, and establish the same test sites again. So um, this, is a, this is a nine-year-old Norway spruce varietal test, and you know, there's, there's, uh, there's several hundreds of varieties in there that were developed from tissue culture that we're testing, and uh, and as those tests grow up, you can assess them for, for the variety of traits, growth rate, straightness, uh, wood quality, and in the case of Norway spruce and in the case of white pine, particularly for uh, white pine weevil resistance, there's genetic resistance to that particular insect. And, uh, and what you can do with these is, is uh, you know, if you look at genetic correlations, um, there's, there's typically, uh, um, you know, there's, there's some that are very fast growing and maybe would have a different, um, I'll explain this very well, but basically you can stack traits so that you can, you can pick specific individuals that maybe are fast growing, but they're also resistant and they're also above average in, in things like density. So you can really, uh, 
you, you can really, well, that's really what you call it in the business is trait stacking. And that's, that's, what, we're, that's what we're trying to do. So as, as soon as you identify the ones with those uh, good combination of traits, then you go back to the cryo storage vat and, and start uh, producing. So this is where the application of genomics comes in. So today, um, we've tested several thousand varieties of spruce and pine ever since 1998. So there's trees, that are, there's trees out there that are closing on, on 15 years old. And uh, you can get a very good assessment of the phenotypes on, on the individual varieties for things like straightness. If you, uh, um, this is off an optimizer in a sawmill. And you can see a crooked tree versus a straight tree and the difference in, uh, in, in lumber yield per cubic meter of wood, huge, huge difference. Um, and then uh, the thing I already mentioned, white pine weevil, this is uh, weevil damage on, uh, on Norway spruce. It uh, doesn't kill the tree, but it, it uh, takes the leader out every so often and it, and it degrades the value clearly. Because all these varieties from somatic embryogenesis are, are produced from within a long, uh, sort of a long-term structured breeding population, um, you can characterize the individual varieties and, as well as the families and the original parents. So, so it really provides great material for uh, genomics researchers to, to develop markers and, and really provide the, uh, the proof of the pudding, say. So uh, um, genomics isn't a business that J.D. Irving's going to get directly involved in, but, but we're certainly interested in working with research partners. And uh, of the initiatives funded through Genome Canada working on forest trees, um, we've been involved with uh, Arborea at the Université de Laval and, uh, and the Treenomics Project at UBC, and, and now with the newly funded uh, Smart Forest Project um, we're, we're, we're partners in those projects and, and primarily our, our participation involves uh, the provision of very well characterized varieties for uh, association studies based on sing single nucleotide polymorphisms and, uh, and really the efforts are aimed at developing genomic selection for things like white pine weevil, uh, wood quality and, and growth rates. And, uh, and so how exactly are we going to use that? Well, basically, if we can get um, markers, we can do early screening, so saves, you know, makes a lot more efficient selection in terms of genetic gain per decade, and, uh, and a lot better testing efficiency. So instead of planting, uh, instead of planting the, the 2,000 varieties in a test, you can get the same potential gain and only maybe plant out 400 varieties, so so huge uh, difference in efficiency. So what are the obstacles? How come how come we aren't using it today? And uh, and and there's certainly some significant uh, issues. Is uh, the one thing being the enormous size of conifer genomes? I think the spruce genomes are, are about 10 times the size of the human genome. There isn't a complete map like you you, you have of the human genome now. Um, and even though you might have uh, a couple thousand markers for a genome that size, it just is, is, it's an insufficient number of markers. And, uh, and uh, each one of the markers has really relatively low individual contribution to, uh, to the phenotypic variation for, for important traits. So these are all things that, uh, that folks uh, struggle with. Um, and, and certainly as well, the high number of parents in the, in the operational breeding programs and the, and the high cost per individual assessment, so though certainly that, uh, that's coming down. In terms of using the technology today, I've never talked to anybody directly that told me they were using um, genomic selection in a breeding program. Though I understand secondhand that there are some folks using, uh, um, using it in eucalyptus in Brazil. And unfortunately, in the forestry business, that goes behind closed doors. So it's, it's hard to get verification on what's actually being done. <coughs> but uh, um, I guess in terms of, in, uh, in conclusion, um, in spite of the real long incubation 
period for, for the development of applications, there, we, we still have optimism that there will be valuable results and certainly there's been big, big investments made in, in, in the field. And uh, from, from my standpoint, uh, J.D. Irving and, and really the, uh, um, uh, generally the tree improvement world in, in the Atlantic region has, uh, has great genetic resources that, uh, that will be very valuable in, in the development of the technology. There's been long-term, um, reasonably funded works through the province of New Brunswick, the province of Nova Scotia, and, and uh, Newfoundland, and, and industry partners, and, and universities working together. So there's a, there's a wealth of material that can be used in, in, uh, in developing genomics applications. And, uh, and certainly the varietal production uh, work that we're doing through somatic embryogenesis is really ideally uh, um, situated for, for integrating genomic selection. Um, real important thing um, that I can see is, is from where I sit, the genomics world is very, very complicated, obviously, from the presentations we've seen. But uh, it's got to have extremely close collaboration with the users, the end users of the technology, if, uh, if we're going to reap the value. Um, in forestry, there's been qu really quite a lot of investment done. I wouldn't say that it's got to the scale where, where uh, they can really talk to users, but that's the critical step that has to happen to, uh, to realize the, uh, the benefits. So that, that was all I had to say. So uh, thank you.